Hello, hello. Welcome one and all. We are ending off the month of January, which has flown by all too quick. And I thought, well, the month of love is upon us. So we might as well do a crash course in houses and weave in how to predict love techniques in astrology. I mean, why not? If you're interested in learning more about how to predict love and romance through the stars or in other methods, then join us for our All About Love, which is going to be a one-time only event. You can sign up through Etsy. Everything is linked in the text box below. It's taking place February the 11th. So without further ado, let's do a crass, a crass course, a crass course in houses, a crash course in houses. Look, this cute little couple. Hopefully they go on a date. Let's do that. Let's see what happens in this gripping story. So topic outline. So introduction. So what's, what's the importance of houses in astrology? I used to teach houses. I might bring that back because it's a lot of fun. And it's something that I find even people who say that they're intermediate don't fully understand the depth and the scope of how to use houses. They really do sing and come to life when you look at a chart and the full meaning of houses in astrology. So I mean, Life, if you've been alive for even a few decades, you quickly come to realize, at least I hope one does, just how much there is to grasp in a single human experience. And you've got to cram all of that into only 12 categories when you're looking at astrology. So that's very overwhelming. So there's definitely a lot to know. And houses are extremely useful, not just the signs and not just the planets. So wherever the planet falls is going to determine where that event takes place. So I always think of it as a play. That's why I use this little <laughs> going to the theater template. But let me set the scene for you in Fair Verona. Like, how are you going to tell a story if you don't know where it takes place? You've got to have that. So the meaning of each house, we'll go through that. And then at the end, just how to predict. So let's just jump into it. Very, very simple. Types of houses. This is a crash course. Oh, look, they, they're on a date. How cute. Types of houses, we've got angular, which is 14710. These are very, very vital houses. They're sort of like the spine of one's chart. They encompass, you know, four pretty important things. One is the self and then all other people. And then the home, private life, let's say your inner self, your mother, and then external factors like success, societal status, authority figures, and your father. So that's, once again, that's 14710. Then you've got trinal houses, which are 159. So you see the first house doing double duty. Pretty, pretty important. Evil houses are Dushtana houses. And that they are 6, 8, and 12, though I'm, I'm very apt to come to their defense because much like everything has its place in life and I always believe there's no good time for something bad to happen. That's life. It happens, does it not? It happens to everyone. It happens to the best of us, as we say. So those houses also serve their purpose. And then slow increasing houses known as Upachaya houses. And that is three, six, 10, 11. So let's say, for example, at the end, when I show you some predictions, somebody's seventh ruler goes into the 10th house. Well, you can already determine just from knowing this in 30 seconds that their spouse might be a powerful person or like an authority figure to them. They might sort of be like in charge because it goes into the 10th house of authority. And because it's a slow increasing house, you know, depending on the planet and the aspects, we could even say, you know what, don't worry if you don't meet them when you're 21, you know, they might be when, coming around when they're, when you're a little bit older, a little bit more seasoned, a little bit more mature, a whole individual. So you put that together that way. Right, one, two, three, four, let's go through it. So the first house, once you're born, this is where we get your physical body. So naturally then, the first house is you, your self-image, your actual appearance. So any planet in the first, so if you're new here, I don't really care much for the outer planets and um, natal charts. Sometimes they're pretty useful to me, but let's say you have any planet, any planet in the first house and the closer to the ascendant, the more influential, that's going to mark that person. It's almost like a stamp. It like marks them with some sort of aura or some sort of like essence, which is why I always find people with Saturn in the first house are very, very easy to spot because they have a natural gravitas and seriousness about them. They're definitely um, mature and wise before their time. It's because it has a lot to do with you. It's going to be about your path in the world, the path that you walk, pain, comfort. Can you overcome challenges? Can you solve your problems? Okay. It's, it's, You've got to be pretty brave. You should have a strong first house or a strong first house ruler is very telling to the health of the chart and the condition of that person's life. So for example, let's say you're a Leo ascendant and the sun is debilitated in Libra 
or Aquarius, well, you know, you could win the lottery, but some of that blessing is somehow lost on you because your chart ruler isn't very robust. Whereas let's say you're a Capricorn rising and Saturn is exalted in Libra. Well, maybe you don't win the lottery, but you just don't take so many things to heart like that. You know, you just sort of can bounce back a bit quicker. Second, so if the first is where we're born as a physical body, we need to eat, we need to make money and buy food. So the second is going to bring us our wealth, our assets. That's like your personal financial standing in the world. Can you support yourself? You know, if you see a strong second house or second house ruler, you know that person, they're going to be all right. They're going to make it on their own, but it is our family. It has to do with our voice. Can you advocate for yourself? Can you speak up for yourself? You know, how do you make your trade? Through speaking, through speech, is it through your hands, through your thinking? So that can have some effect. Uh, very nice to see a strong second house. Generally, you'll definitely see money there. The third house, speaking of money, is effort. Yourself. Are you going to be self-made? You know, I use the chart of Alexander Skarsgård for success and some other things as well. It's just a very nice chart. And I believe he is the North Node in the third. And I said in a video last year that had he had he not been his uh, father's son, he still would have been successful. So being a nepotism baby, you can kind of tell that really doesn't, um, I don't want to say blemish, it doesn't really stain the person with a certain reputation because if that third house is busting and it's very tenacious and it's very active, that person's just going to be like, they're going to steamroll whatever's in their way to get what they want, right? And it's amazing because it's a house of communication. Actually, the third house rules uh, acting. So you get actors in the third house. There's a fun fact. Movement, motion, right? If it's, if it's got a lot of things going on, some planets in there, the person could be a dancer. They could like speed, you know, they could like traveling. They can have a natural sense of restlessness. They want to move around and move quite a bit, you know, like move. I, and I knew one third house person who by the time I met them in their mid-20s had moved 21 times because both them and their their parents just couldn't well it was the parents decision but I guess it, they inherited it they couldn't sit still it rules the hands and therefore it rules writing it rules communication so written text if you want to see someone who's going to write and actually publish something you should see something on the axis of three and nine then we get to the fourth house we've got mother home truthfulness kindness I did it, one of my first videos on serial killers. Somebody wrote in and asked if I can make a video on that. And I'm laughing only because it wasn't until the end of that recording that I actually clicked. Um, if you have a malefic in the fourth house, it can kind of tarnish that person's happiness. And they, they find it hard to feel settled in life. Like really lucky people will have Jupiter in the fourth house, even if he's debilitated, you know. And then some of us, they get Saturn in the fourth house. So I did this whole thing on serial killer. They're like, oh my God, look at this. Saturn in the fourth house. And then I realized I have Saturn in the fourth house. So it, it um, you know, it can make you very somber and serious or melancholy and have deep, dark thoughts. But because it's a house that can give good counseling, um, it makes the person, you know, I say it makes you the voice of reason in your friend group, but I've also lived this and it gets you in trouble. <laughs> it gets you in trouble when you tell the truth because Saturn doesn't like untruthfulness. So, um, you know, moon is wonderful in the fourth house. If you have that, Venus is very nice in the fourth house. Very, very lovely. Even a stellium in the fourth house aspects the 10th. It is a success forming combination. So, Sooner or later, those people tend to make it. So that's the fourth. So don't underestimate the fourth house. People always think it's so soft, you know, but mm -hmm, watch out. Aspects, they make the chart come to life. So it all makes sense. The fifth, this is the trinal house. And it is got to do with children and creativity. Creativity, you literally create another human being. So the health of the fifth house can show, will that person be a parent? Do they have the capacity for, and the fertility to be uh, a parent? Fa fatherhood or motherhood? And then we've got learning as well as there. We've got hobbies. And because it does rule the love life, you'll get dating and you'll get uh, falling in love. So when we do our all about love, I will show you how to use this to see if you're better suited to monogamy, polyamory, if you're better suited for dating. Should you actually enjoy dating? Should you even care or waste your time dating? 
Or are you better suited for marriage? You can actually decipher those things, but it's a wonderful house. And we're actually going to give away some um, spiritual practices. One in particular that's ruled by the fifth house. So you can actually attract the spouse that you're wanting to attract. That's the whole point of the day. So people ask, I answer. That's how it works. So we've got house number six. Like I said, quite unpopular, <laughs> but it's necessary. It's a necessary house, right? You want to buy things, you want to do things in the world, you've got to what? You've got to work. So you've got work, service to others, pets, you know, being charitable, um, health and disease is seen from the sixth, but also um, debts, okay, owing something and litigation, fighting, because it's the house of accusations. So if you've got your seventh ruler in the sixth house, well, you better have your chart analyzed to see if that's actually going to work for you long term or if it's going to cause some trouble. And if it is, then we've got to sort out that timing so you can be ahead of it. Seventh house, here we go, the whole point of this presentation, marriage partner and the most crucial house when we're looking at marriage. Okay, so it's not the only house we would look to to see the condition of a good marriage. But it's very important because it's the opposite from yourself. So the marriage partner is the farthest from you. If I'm in the first house, my marriage partner is in the opposite house. So it's very, very telling what sign and any planets that fall in there and the cusps. So there we go. It's other people. And because it's the farthest from your body, it actually rules foreign travels. It rules moving. Okay. So if you've got something really active there, you could probably predict that person's going to live abroad or away from their birthplace. And if they don't, then their fortune would blossom if they did. It's also the house of sex. So very interesting. Eighth house, inheritance, other people's resources, other people's money, taxes, insurance, payouts, uh, benefits, things like that, class action lawsuits, and spouses wealth. So if the second is the money you make, the second from the seventh is the eighth, and that's the money your partner, your husband or wife is going to make. And then in-laws, because if the second is your parents, the eighth is going to be your partner's parents. Amongst other things, it's a very energy-rich house. It's it's the house of things not seen but felt. You know, it's very good for like hypnotherapy, psychotherapy, social work, Reiki, energy work, all that stuff, okay? And including the result of what happens in the eighth house, wink, wink, which I'm sure there will be a bout of babies born after <laughs> Valentine's Day. So in the ninth house, we have belief. And this is also studying in terms of the fifth is like more a primary education. The ninth is more higher level education. I'll try to remember to mention something about studying. So it's more like university, PhD programs, okay, pilgrimage, religious beliefs, and legalities. Okay, so this is a very important thing for long distance travel. Legalities, why? That, that will be something like getting your passport, getting a visa approved, customs, you know, when they stamp your passport, that's all seen through the ninth house. It's your dharma. So it's a very important house. And then the tenth, we have status, like I said, societal status, okay? Success. So you work hard in the sixth house, you have trade, you have business with people, other people in the seventh house. Will any of that amount to anything? Do you have a trashed second house and sixth house, but you have a smashing 10th house? Well, then sooner or later, you're going to make something of yourself. It's a slow increasing house, but you can definitely see that. And there we go. Authority, institutions, you know, like banking, government system, education systems, like huge institutions. Okay, that's going to be the um, 10th. And then your public image. So how the world sees you, how you impact the world around yourself. Very important house. Again, it's an angular house. 11th, auspicious house, very nice house. Friends, colleagues, people you see at the gym in your exercise class, etc. If you've got hobbies in the fifth house, well, that opposes the 11th. And if they're both quite rich, you know, then you could. I'm actually, I launched a book club. So maybe you're part of that book club. You make friends and it enriches you somehow because it's your hobby. And through that hobby, you make friends and you have gains. This is the house of gains. If it could be wrapped up in one word, it's that. It's just you get something. You get an award. You get praise, compliments, recognitions, gifts. And of course, it's long-term goals because it's a slow increasing house. So this is why you see things like investments. And it's a one of the financial houses I'll explain. But because we're doing love, we're not going to talk about money. Bonus guru grit tidbit is trysts. So, you know, nobody really will attribute this to like cheating, let's say, but let's say the person has a bunch of other stuff going on in their chart and then you see a sneaky transit to the 11th or something going on in the 11th. You're like, wow, 
that person just can't get enough. They just get a thrill out of something like that, you know. It falls into a specific sign with a specific planet. You could probably use your imagination and see that they themselves have a quite fertile imagination. And then the 12th, so I'll just wrap this up. Remember how I was saying about studying? So the 5th is like learning, like primary learning. And then higher learning is the ninth. But actual studying, like to revise your notes, to go over course materials or spiritual study, religious study, that is the 12th. Because it's the house of isolation, solitude, and losses, okay? So you can't be, be, you can't be around other people. You need to be alone. You need to be in a quiet room. That's where you do your, your note taking. You can, I kind of like my, my sister used to call my room in the cave. I'm sort of like huddled away into my dark corner and I'm just... I, I mean, I've showed my room before on the lives and people said it gave them anxiety. How <laughs> many books are stacked on top of each other? But that's very 12th house energy, right? You're just sort of like a wizard and they're in their little laboratory. And this is the place of foreign connections. So perfect for the modern age, you know, people who go on a Megal, people who go on Facebook and people who work from home or have a contact to the international branch or arm of a company that's maybe you're in California and they're in Germany. Maybe they're in Germany and they're working for someone or calling someone in Singapore, Malaysia. Okay, so that's all 12th house things. Foreign lands, place of dreams, sleeping, lounging around in bed, you know, like perfect Sunday morning. That's 12th house energy. Secrets as well. So pillow talk, you know, sharing with someone. Okay, so very imaginative house that rules fantasy so very very nice for romance and quite crucial I think so that's that now what do we look for when we predict love so let's say transits seventh house is very important is anything hitting that seventh house by transit I put Venus and Jupiter there because Venus is going to be the wife for the husband and then Jupiter is the husband for the wife if you are a man looking to marry a man, focus on Jupiter for the partner, but Venus is the signifier of marriage for everyone, right? So like, let's say I have a good Jupiter, but my Venus is very trashed. So it can, it can show I will marry a good person. I'll be happy, but life just isn't roses, you know, and some people have a really strong Venus, but then a really weak, um, Spousal indicator. So they're just going to be happy no matter what, even if their partner is not like on the same page as them or something. You just have to know how to dis discern. So ruler of the seventh, what's going on with that partner? You know, with that planet, is it indicating a partner for you? Fifth house is very important because as we mentioned, it's your, it's your love life. Okay. Are you going to be dating? Are you going to be interested in that? And so forth. So also Venus, if you're a woman looking to marry a woman, focus on Venus. Very important. It's going to tell you a lot. So let's start a little exercise. Assuming that, assuming that you're a Scorpio ascendant, okay, um, Jupiter will be entering Taurus. This is a seventh house. It's opposite, okay? And so with that, we know that Jupiter brings more of everything. So if Jupiter is going to expand the seventh house, he's going to expand your prospects this spring, right? I mentioned that in my yearly videos, so go watch them if you're a Scorpio rising, and so we're going to have more people throwing themselves at us. So the tricky thing about astrology, well, it's not tricky. It's actually very, it's, it's genius, is we can say, oh, there's a really high chance for you to meet someone this year. And you go, great. I have this idea of my perfect person. So you go to 10 house parties and you meet 10 different people in the span of 10 weekends. How do you know you give your phone number to the right one? Or how do you know you ask the person, the right person for their phone number? Well, that's where spousal descriptions come in. So you can sort of uh, stack those up and see how they pan out. So Jupiter in the seventh, as I mentioned, but here's another helpful part. Remember how I said the fifth has to do with love life? Well, Jupiter rules Pisces, which sits in the fifth from the ascendant. So that when the fifth ruler goes into the seventh, that's very, very good indicator that you could meet somebody pretty important. Okay, we'll go into more depth when we do all about love, but that's a simple one. Fifth ruler in the seventh, give yourself a point. Jupiter transiting the seventh, give yourself a point. You know, um, and a Venus as well. So any Aquarius risings in my yearly video, I mentioned you are like marked, you are the lucky ones this year because Venus is going to be spending so much time in Leo in 2023 from June 5th to October the 8th. So if you're an Aquarius rising, 
then this is an amazing year for you to meet somebody because the planet of relationships is attracting more people to you. She's spending a great deal of time there. So now, assuming that you're a Taurus rising, wow, such beautiful art I make. <laughs> Let's say Jupiter is going to go into your first house, May 16th, and he's going to remain there from May 2023 till May 2024. So this is where aspects are quite helpful. We see that he's going to make your reputation larger because he expands what he touches. So your self-image. So you could have an increase in confidence, get more invitations to go out, to socialize, weddings, engagement, dinners, showers, whatever, clubbing, salsa dancing, whatever you prefer. But through aspects. So he has aspects, right? So he's aspecting the fifth of dating the seventh of partners of marriage and the ninth of legalities and institutions. So if you come to All About Love or if you've taken houses, classes with me before, you'll know the significance of this transit. And this is a very, very favorable. It's very auspicious. When Jupiter goes into someone's first house, goes over their sign, it's just like the luckiest thing that can happen. Happens once every 12 years, but we take what we can get. So Jupiter and Taurus video is also coming up. I will definitely make one of those for all the signs, how it's going to affect you. But, you know, if you've got uh, Scorpio or Taurus rising, then obviously I've just told you it's going to be very nice for love, but I'll, I'll go into more detail. So this is excellent for meeting somebody. But notice how I've used this example here that neither of their seventh lords play in so directly. It's not so obvious, but we can discern. We'll say, hey, Jupiter's transit is quite you know, important. And he's heavy. So he's casting a strong aspect to these very important houses. Could also indicate a child, you know, so very, very nice. All right. Other things to consider. Something like fifth ruler in the fifth. So let's say that you are a Capricorn ascendant. And um, yeah, why not? You know, Venus, Venus goes through Taurus. So that's fifth ruler in the fifth. That's a very nice time. Seventh ruler in the seventh. Very cool. You know, let's say you are a uh, Leo rising and Saturn has spent a good deal of time in Aquarius. You know, he's going to leave in March, but that's a two and a half year window. You could meet someone. Venus generally transiting the seventh, as I mentioned. Yes, of course, that's going to be amazing thing for Aquarius risings. And for those of you who really want to know, I'm bringing back love readings only for the month of February. I've taken them down last year. So we're going to have spouse descriptions will be coming back and then love timing readings. So you could go through, let's say you say, Monica, I'm single. It's March and I want to know what's going to happen between March, April through August. Am I going to have an active summer, my love life? Should I date? Should I accept this proposal or something like that? So it's for the month of February only. We're doing love readings. They're coming back. And then the all about love. So you can sign up on Etsy. It's on February the 11th, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to do one of each. Okay, like one prayer, one mantra, one ritual, one Vastu thing that you can do, uh, one nakshatra you can use to manifest love. And then we're going to save about 40, 45 minutes. I usually go over, so that's why I didn't want to say 30 minutes, but we're going to go into in-depth techniques. And uh, with everyone's permission, of course, whoever first come, first serve, you can volunteer your chart as an example. And I'm happy to give examples for love timing. But it's a one-time only event. And we'll, of course, leave some time for a Q&A at the end. And then book clubs. So we're going to do an esoteric spirituality astrology book club for Guru Grit. So that's also available on Etsy now. And the first one's going to be last Sunday of February. And because it is February, we're going to do like a love theme or relationship theme book, such as like Dr. John Gray's Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, or, you know, Healing Yourself something quite gracious to like allow the love of the universe to flow through us. But then we'll do like a theme every month. So like March is International Women's Day. So we're going to do a book of women by Osho. And then maybe for like April, we enter into tourist season. So we'll do like a financial literacy book or something. But all of them will have like a spiritual and self-improvement connotation. So as always, thank you so much for listening. And thank you so much for writing in your questions and your queries. Oh, look at that little couple made it out of the theater. 
love to see it. So ask questions. Uh, feel free if you have any questions about the events coming up as well. You know where to find me. More information in the description box below. Let me know if you have any comments, concerns. Let me know if you like it. All the best and happy early Valentine's Day to you all. Bye.